Maths is the best subject. Welcome to Think and Debate about Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest, time poor, but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. Now I'm joined by Elliot Morgan and Johnny Hall. How's it going, Johnny? Oh, that's well, thank you. You? Yeah, can't complain. Um, so we're going to talk about task design. What are the features of a well-designed task or question? And obviously this is very subjective. What, what do you guys think? I'd like to say hi to Elliot because I've never met you before in, in face-to-face. Yeah. I've seen you on Twitter, obviously, while loads of times, but no, I've never, never seen you in the flesh, so to speak. So. Okay, um, features of a good task. Right. Okay, so I've got some notes on my uh, phone here. I think the key thing is for me, well, first off, what, what do you mean by a task? Because there's millions and millions of different types of tasks. So how are you going to define your task? Is it just going to be something for building fluency or is it something for sort of mathematical thinking or are you going to go along the lines of sort of like some mixed practice where the, the questions might seem safe on the same on the surface but actually the depth is different or the reverse of that where the questions look totally different to each other but underneath it's the same mathematical structure so there's all sorts of different tasks I think for me and you know, the tasks that I like to design in particular I guess I like like low floor low floor tasks where every kid can see it it's quite engaging. Yeah, there's a nice hook to it, maybe, or something. Everyone can access it, but then you can take it really, really far. Yeah, so it's, it's how you can extend the task for me. And I think that's quite in, quite important. So something interesting, which gets the kids engaged, and um, you can develop a mathematical concept uh, through it by extending it. I agree. That. I was thinking along the same lines as Johnny. Like You, you need to first consider like, the purpose of what a task is. In my experience of observing a lot of people in the last couple of years, I think the task should never take the basics for granted. Like it, it, at, at its core, the task has to give the learner the opportunity to apply the knowledge that they've been taught. That That's like the, the very core feature of any well-designed task or, or question. So it needs to provide that opportunity to, to build like a shared notion of understanding between the teacher and the pupil. The teacher said, look, I've taught you this and now your chance to go and show me that you've learned X or, or whatever it may be. So at, at its core, a well-designed task is always thinking about what is it I want the learner to think about or do. And there needs to be, like I know we talked about it on a previous episode of uh, Tadape, like with learning objectives. We talk about like a task being the chance to go from a clear path from A to B. Like the start of the lesson, you come in, you don't know this, but by the end of the lesson, you are going to know this. And, and the task is somewhere along that journey, along with instruction and questioning and assessment or whatever, for the people to go from A to B. Uh, the thing that comes to mind for me as well is um, Bruna, like that seminal paper on scaffolding, that like the learner needs to understand what that outcome is. So what B is before they can get to it. Otherwise, the scaffolds, it's, it's not a useful scaffold in uh, in supporting them to get there. Um, and then there's, there's that sort of generic stuff, isn't there? Like, how's the task going to uh, guide student attention? How are we going to challenge the learner, like, like Johnny said? And I think like lastly, I would say like the, the best task for me have gone through some sort of iterative process where it's been refined over time. Um, like they may have been ineffective when we first used them, but we've redesigned them once we've tried them, implementate, uh, implemented them, we've got new information and then we've adapted them or redesigned them so that they they can better support pupils in the future. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because like quite often you might design a task or think of a task, use it in the classroom and then immediately after the lesson, you're like kicking yourself thinking, oh, I wish I'd used a different number there. I wish I'd changed the question slightly there or next time I'll do this. And I think that's so, so important to go away. And like, if, if you can, the same day while it's still fresh in your mind, you know what teaching's like, if you don't do it there and then uh, you'll forget about the task and then you might roll around in another few months time and think, oh, I wish I'd made that change, that change then. So that iterative process of making tasks. There's some tasks I've used like maybe hundreds of times now and I'm pretty sure they're about as good as they're going to get but there's there's new tasks that I'm making all the time where after the first go, go through you, you, you want to change the numbers there's even those tasks that like when you go to use it the 101st time for some reason it doesn't work with that group or that class and that's like the beauty yeah, of yeah. like a constant ongoing thing that's why I like tasks which are flexible five minutes in so I think I'll, I'll mention completion tables by now 
Kieran sick of me uh, talking about these in our in our day to day job, but I do love uh, the idea of a completion table. If um, if you don't know what they are, they're essentially a, a sort of row of headings along the top, and then normally like a series of different numbers down the side and it could just be asking you to add the two numbers together or it might be asking you to share it in a particular ratio uh, but it's really nice because it, that's where that low floor high ceiling that i mentioned comes in you can just have let's go with sharing a ratio you might just have your quantities down the side and what ratio you're sharing them in along the top so it might be 50 quid in the ratio two to three or something like that but then you can reverse the problem as well so give them give them the solution give them part a or give them part b and what, what what was the total amount shared and stuff like that and you can you can really increase the difficulty of the question just by reversing what part of the completion table you're actually you're actually showing to the kids yeah sounds good sounds like it would like a sort of task that very easily guides their attention as well because like you said it's in that mm. format absolutely like the idea that you can adapt it so like you could put individual values here and then that's what your challenge is, isn't it yeah, yeah. Simple Chris McGrain, I should mention Chris McGrain, um, he's on Twitter, he's got loads of on it on his starting points maths website. It does exactly, that's that, the first row is normally completely revealed, um, that's that where the low floor is, and then as you go down the table you get less and less information or harder initial information and, and try and work backwards. Yeah, there's your scaffold there as well then, isn't it, if the first one's exactly, done for yeah. you. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's all pretty great, I mean, I, I'm not a secondary maths teacher, but uh, I, I learned a lot from his book, just in the sort of general principles and thinking behind designing tasks. So I definitely recommend his book. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mathematical tasks, it's called, isn't it? Do you think then it's impossible to give a generic set of features for a well-designed task? Do you think it's task-specific or what you want the outcome of the yeah. task to be specific? And so you would need to look individually at different types of tasks to come up with a set of um, set of features. I think there's there's quite a few sort of almost boilerplate boilerplate template tasks that you can use. Like, are you going to use a minimally different? Are you going to use the same surface, different depth? Are you going to use a completion table? There's loads of little boilerplate tasks, which I think card sorts as well as as, as another one of them. Which I think like, yeah, it's it's you selecting the task and you've been able to justify the reason you're using that particular task for this particular class at this particular time. Um, that's where the skill of the teacher comes in and the knowledge of your class comes in. Because like what Elliot said, yeah, one task for one class might go completely wrong or completely differently for another class. Yeah, so that's where the skill of the teacher comes in really, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if there can be like features that can be like generic because like tasks are, bes are bespoke to the class, aren't they? But I think there can be sort of guiding mm. principles behind the tasks that, that are generic, like make it challenging, make it... Uh, easy to engage with um, mm. and things like that, which can be applied to every every task in every subject. But I'm not sure about features within an individual task could be the same. I mean, I'm obviously massively towards a biased on the maths on the maths front of here. And like maths is so nice for just being able to, for instant extension challenge, just reversing the question all the time. Even if you're doing simple number bonds to 10 or something, Okay, seven plus what is ten? But then, okay, oh, give me three different pairs which have number bonds to ten. Give me twenty different pairs which number bonds to ten, and then kids start thinking about decimals. Hang on, because there's not enough whole number of number bonds. Okay, give me more which is not got a decimal, and then you could start introducing. Okay, one of the numbers has to be a negative, and then all of a sudden you've got like tons of extension from a simple question just by saying, "Here's the answer." What was the what was the question? Maths is the best subject for task design. Uh, it was always my favorite to teach but like, like you said it's just so easy to extend and challenge and adapt mm -hmm. so simply what are the features of a well-designed task for you because obviously you've written at least 100 tasks in your time <laughs> um, what, what do you what do you think the the features of a well-designed task are i echo what the boys have said about you know it depends on what the purpose of it is and there are lots of different ways you can do it but i think Re like being able to recall some prior learning, linking it to what you know, think about what's coming next, the, the ability to extend it very easily. And, you know, like Johnny said, additional questions that you can just fire off because it's that open. And I think also not making it just like a tick box, kind of working through really easy questions that you think that they'll just fly through because that's not the point. I think I, I think I'm sure Elliot's already said it and he's written about it loads of times where, I think sometimes teachers think that their tasks or lessons have gone well because the children have flown through a task mm. and therefore they think, well, it must have been well designed. But actually, 
it hasn't necessarily given them what they wanted from the yeah. task. That's really easy to do with maths, with things like expanding brackets. You can teach anyone a really successful, in quotes, lesson on expanding brackets or something just by getting them to regurgitate a procedure or something. But as soon as you try and mix it up by adding an extra an extra term in the brackets or re mm -hmm. reverse them around a little bit or sticking a... It's, um, I mean, expanding binomials is a classic where you've got a two by two array. Everyone can do it when they're doing grid multiplication with two digit by two digit numbers. And then we extend it when we get to secondary with like X plus two times X plus three. But as soon as you put that third term in, if kids have only ever seen a two by two, they, they can be completely stumped by that. Um, so you've got to be careful with the, the task. I think there's a time and place for really easy questions. And that's probably during some sort of session of maybe I do, we do or something like that, just to make sure they can literally get the question right. But really quickly, you want to get them thinking a bit more deeply about what's actually going on. You want those easier questions early on in a lesson or early on in a in a like independent practice so that they get gain some success and are motivated mm. to continue but you obviously don't want that to be the entirety of what you're getting them to do no you just reminded me of my last lesson of the the year before we broke up i cracked and i gave them calculated coloring to do <laughs> i like one of the kids at the end of the lesson just said sir that was the best lesson i've had all year <laughs> <laughs> they were engaged, they were colouring for a full solid hour and the kid thought it was the best masters that they had that year. So that poor proxy for learning is probably at play there a little bit. <laughs> I'd, probably, I'd probably argue they probably didn't, didn't learn as much as they maybe thought they had learned during that lesson. I mean, well, they were engaged and working hard for an hour, so... And at the end of the term... That's all you have on the 20, 20th of December, yeah. <laughs> or 16th, yeah. whatever it was. <laughs> well, that, that, in, in, that's the best like possible task, isn't it? Where they think they're just having fun, but secretly underneath it, there's, there's a bit of learning going on that they're not even aware is necessarily happening. Whether that just is just like simple retrieval or recall, or it's like much mm. deeper. Something, that's the sort of dream task, isn't it? Whereas I think sometimes we tip the balance too far in favour of let's make it fun. And we don't think enough about like, what is it we want them to think about while they're doing it? The thing is, the things that are really helpful when children are learning or anybody's learning are really difficult to see. It's like, you know, Dylan Williams thing where he says about them, um, the feedback should bring about a change in the learner, not the work. Well, there's there's absolutely no way of realizing if that's definitely happened or not. You know, so you're just going on your instinct and things, aren't you? How about a poorly designed task? How can you tell if something has just been thrown together with uh, with little thought? I think there's going to be a lot, a lot more answers for this one. I think it's very easy to spot. Often you've got um, teachers who will go to well-known resource websites and pluck something off that they think is related, but they won't have read the whole thing. They won't necessarily know where the questions are leading, what the challenge is. And you can see there's a, there's a gap between their instruction and what the actual task is. And then the children are kind of flummoxed to a point where it's not an appropriate level of challenge because they haven't mm. been given the, the tools to succeed. Yeah, just going to math spot differentiated questions and hitting 30 questions in each column off you go, see you in an hour. That's <laughs> probably what I'd say is not a well-designed task. Um, but I've seen it. I've seen it being done mm. more times than I'd like. I always say it's the best and the worst results I've ever made, that thing, because it is really convenient, but like, it's not designed to just give kids 30 questions to do. Like, whenever I use that resource, it's normally just for the, okay, can you get the procedure right resource? Mm -hmm. And I'll limit it to maybe three questions in each column tops. I certainly won't just blast out 100 questions and say, right, crack on. Like with the curriculum chat that was happening just before and with Matt's session about how he provides the planning, you can give the best resource or the... the mm -hmm most well-intentioned resource like yours is but it, it, it will still get lost because people haven't understood the theory behind it or whatever it might be yeah there's that quote in there saying any task can be used really well or any task can be used horrendously bad i think it's a john mason one I paraphrase massively there but i think the issue of um the like going on tes or just like downloading a resource is that a lot of the times teachers don't then reverse engineer back from the task so that the instruction suits it really well. Um, they might just like plan a lesson, 
come up with some slides or whatever, and then they're just like frantically searching for a task and download one. And it just doesn't necessarily have like that close link or, or, or as well as we'd like it to be linked. And then obviously the lesson falls down there because th there's not the appropriate opportunity for them to, to demonstrate what it is they've learned. And I think for the working through the tasks themselves beforehand is almost essential. Like the maths world is blessed with the Don Stewart website. Uh, but he purposely doesn't give any answers for any of his tasks. So as a maths teacher, you have to take a task and work through it and see. And there's, it's never just a straightforward thing he's given. It, there's always there's always a twist in there to make you think mathematically. So using those for things like departmental meetings is a, is a, is a great is a great use of time. I think like you've got some topics coming up. Get on Don Stewart. Pick a few pick a few relevant things coming up in the scheme of work and work through those tasks for 10 minutes at the start of a department or meeting or something like that. Particularly as you get into the kind of chunkier and more uh, meaty problems. I know that when I was in my NQT year, we had Problem Solving Friday and uh, we went to Enrich and Enrich is full of amazing problems. Oh, Enrich is good, yeah. Mm. Uh, yet we were just snipping them, printing them out, handing them to the children and saying, crack on. And then they'd come to me and say, what do I do? And I'd look at it and go, I don't know, because I haven't, I haven't read it and I haven't done it myself. Yeah. And I'd sit there and do it and go, oops. It's interesting. I think like sometimes, not every single Friday, sometimes it's good to see kids. <laughs> so it's sometimes good to see kids see a teacher actually work through a problem from scratch. Mm. Like a question they've never seen before, maybe towards the back end of a higher GCSE paper or something, something that's cropped up. And, and sometimes you have to just sit there for a minute or two until it makes sense. And I think... It's useful for kids to see that, but probably time. not not all the probably Everybody. not even close to all the time. Maybe like ninety five percent of the time, the teacher should know exactly what they're doing and exactly where the task goes and what other areas of maths you can connect it to. And that <laughs> thing. I also think um, similar to that, where problems are quite meaty or wordy, tasks that are overwhelming when it comes to like the the actual process of of doing the task where they have to think mm. far more about how they get through the task and take the, and answer each question or whatever the steps are than actually about the content of what you're doing and that that could apply to any subject obviously but I, I'm sure a lot the, the three of us are probably thinking maths but yeah. um, <laughs> anything that's like cognitively cognitively overwhelming them that they can't then take what they need to take from the the actual learning intention. The, the one that always comes to mind for me there is when you first teach long multiplication, because like they need to think about times tables, but they also need to think about the process of going through the, mm -hmm. the long multiplication. And I naively, whenever I taught it for the first few years of my career, would just go, right, we've, we've looked at long multiplication. Here you go. It's 30 questions in it. But then I realized over time that like, oh, those who aren't confident in their times tables, I'm just going to give them the times tables on a sheet. I'm just going to give them the grids. Mm. So now that they're just thinking about what it is I want them to think about, which is the process mm. of long multiplication. I'm not worried about times tables yet. I know it's like requisite core knowledge they need for this, but I'm going to come to that in a few days time once they're secure in the, the format. And I go, right, now you know the format and you don't need to think about it, the process of long multiplication. Now I want you to think about the times tables as well. Yeah. So I think that's, that's like a a big area where tasks are like poorly designed where yeah. um almost, i call, like call it like the two task paradox where like your intention is to just give them one task but you sort of accidentally given them two in, in, in like and it happens a lot in english where it's like read this bit and now turn it into a piece of writing and so well, those are sort of two separate tasks and like you need to do them one at a time to, for them to be mm. as successful as, as you may like and there's a bit in between there as well yeah, like, yeah. ideally you're spot on there and we're in a similar boat when it comes to teaching secondary as well because two-thirds of the maths GCSE is calculator based mm -hmm. and like kids have had potentially like 16 years of school and then they still don't know the times tables like if you're trying to teach them a bit of sharing in a ratio or, or whatever just give them a calculator at this stage and it's I like there's two schools of thoughts I guess like something well no until they've got their multiplication tables why should you be teaching them sharing in a ratio but like they're not going to get any marks on the GCSE paper and it's our duty as a teacher to maximise their grade. So, yeah, if we're teaching them a topic, yeah, you can have a calculator for virtually everything, and especially in sort of year 10s and 11s if they're still weak with the tables. Like, with all the will in the world, they've not learned them in 14, 15 years. They're not going to suddenly mag magically learn them in the, last, in the last. So for all our lessons, yeah, we have calculators available for them just for that very reason. So they're not thinking about extra stuff 
which we don't want them to be thinking about at the time. We don't want them to think about times tables if they're, they're trying to learn this new concept. You can yeah. see Emma's just said in the chat about um, it not matching input as well. And that's one of the points that I kind of jotted down earlier. That... There's a chat. There is a chat along down. It's down the side of my screen. I don't oh, know. Yeah. I'm going to make it as a tech wizard, Johnny. <laughs> You're the guy who codes websites. I've never <laughs> used Restream.io before. I've never even heard of it before. <laughs> <laughs> well, Emma, my walkthroughs pal, just said right. that, um, you know, often people have no idea what to do because the activity or the modeling or the explanation is so different to what their task is meant to be. And that, again, is another um, another way that you can spot a teacher that's not necessarily thought about. Yeah. In well, Emma, if you stick around to, for 6 p.m., that's my first guiding principle of task design. Really? Like, it's, it's the I, thing I, I think... always say, and I think I've said it a couple of times already, like the absolute core thing is that the task must match your instructional intentions. So, like, yeah, I'm, I'm exactly with mm. Emma there. And I think the most common we see it, and I was guilty of this myself, is ECTs. Like, it happens a lot when you're a novice in your career. Like, I learned the hard way from many, many mistakes. Um, but, yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree more with Emma there. Yeah. I think Emma's been around since the start, if not very close to the start. So if she's still here at 6 p.m., she'll have done some <laughs> shit and fair play to her. I think yeah. it's a it's a very common pitfall for ECTs to jump into. They see a lovely task mm. and they try and shoehorn it in the lesson rather than... You know, on Pinterest, probably. Yeah, rather than thinking, okay, my kids need to learn this specific thing. Yeah. Let's either find a task which hits this specific thing, which probably exists, certainly in the mass world, virtually everything exists for you. It's a case of picking it or... If you want to be creative, design something yourself for it. Yeah. I think that that goes good though back to your boil uh, to your question, Kieran, what makes a, a rubbish task? It's basically if your task is not appropriate for the current attainment of your class and what mm. you're wanting to learn, then that makes it a bad task in that circumstance. Neil's asked if there's anything by or based on Don Stewart's work that matches per, sort of the maths we would explore typically in primary. <laughs> I think Enrich, or like Sharon, uh, Shannon said, um, there's loads of primary stuff, which is Don stewart I guess. I mean, there is a fair bit on Don Stewart itself, which is suitable for, for yeah. primary. Yeah, definitely. And so, someone with Neil's expertise could look at those tasks and ask himself how he could make them accessible for different groups mm -hmm. of kids. And yeah, mm -hmm. so that's a, another evening project. Once he's finished looking at all those history websites, he can uh, he can check that out. Well, I know Neil's a fan of the task book as well I'm making in our, in our day, -to -job, day jobs with, with the South. I'm doing a little videos with those as well. So that's uh... Just to add, because um, the second part of the question was like, how do you know um, if it's just been like thrown together with little four? And I just mm -hmm. thought something, because um, Shannon sort of hit it at the poor proxies. Um, I forget the, their names, but they're two people um, I think it's in my talk later. They talk about looking for um, proxies for working memory as evidence that like a task isn't working. Uh, and I think this could perhaps be evidence that it's been poorly designed or, or little thought as well. Um, so they talk about, I think there's four things. So the pupil struggle to retrieve the relevant information. So that could just be like the cues that you've put in the task aren't clear enough. Um, mm -hmm. They're not obvious enough. They're maybe a bit muddled. Um, that the pupils fail to follow the instructions of the task so it could be that the instructions themselves aren't, aren't very clear um whether that be in the input or within the task if it's written down um that people struggle to keep their place which i know is very common when you've got like two pieces of information and they're flicking back and forth especially if one's like a, a big text uh, like too much information to attend to um and then the last one is if like if people just abandon the task altogether if they get distracted easily um or yeah are just not trying to complete the task this one's the question I'm most interested in, right? So we've got three relatively expert teachers. What are you thinking about when you sit down to design a task? What's going through your head when you sit down? Yes, so you're sitting in your staff room, you're planning your task. What are you thinking about? Well, I think it touches on um, kind of what we've mentioned. The, ve the absolute very first thing is, um, before I even think about tasks, is what what am I teaching this class next lesson? Yeah. What 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 do I want them to to know by the end of this lesson? And my my lessons, quite a lot of them will have a similar structure, which I guess most math teachers would probably do. A bit of an I turn, I do, you do. But well, before the I do, you do, it's it's introducing the topic, and I think that's something that's um, potentially missed by 
a few maths teachers, they might go straight into the I do, we, we do, without a little preamble of what are we actually doing this for? Why is it interesting mathematically? Or why could this possibly be useful? What, what's the hook for doing it? And, and then go into the I do, you do. Then the first task of, okay, can you actually repeat, can you regurgitate and get these, get this, this stuff right? And then I get into what I call the more interesting bit of the lesson where I will have some sort of task for the, for the kids to do, whether it be a completion table or, or whatever. And I'm, I've been teaching like maths for, I think it's 17 years now. So like my library of tasks and, and where, where I go to is obviously like extensive and it's a case of, okay, selecting from that library what I'm, what I'm actually going to, to use. So it's for me, it's not necessarily about, I don't need to think hard about the task itself. It's more about what am I teaching and which task shall I use for, for that lesson, which I, I guess is a bit different to maybe an early careers teacher who are, who are more along the lines of, oh my God, I'm teaching this topic for the first time. What resources are available for me? I'm not sure if I've answered the question, but I think, I think I've tried to. You have, because in your, yeah. you're saying in, in your position, this is what you're thinking about. You know, yeah. what am I teaching, and which tasks align with that with that um, that sort of aim that got, which mm. is it, it, which is entirely fair. And like you say, it might be that Shannon and Elliot have the ECT in mind when they describe their thought process. You know, but I think you know there'll be lots of teachers of different experience listen, and it's well it's well worth considering um, what the actual thoughts are. You know, you you can't make up a situation. You know, just for the sake of the question. Once you've been doing it a while in, in your subject knowledge there, you, you don't really need to have anything prepared as well. Like we had a situation um, back, uh, back at the start, start of last term, um, not this year, but last September, where we had no tech for two weeks at all. So people couldn't fire up PowerPoint or anything like that. And I was just in my element then. I'd just like write a little prompt on the board or something like the answer is 20. What is the question? That's that sort of stuff or just some classic tasks like 1089. Uh, whereas some of the other department, others in the department were a bit like, oh, what, what do I do here? Uh, do I go to the photocopier every lesson and print out a set of 30 sheets for each of my five classes? And that's like 150 sheets of uh, worksheets to print out. It's like, no, just here's, here's some tasks which don't need any preparation. Mm. Just pull it out. And it's, I think I'm not sure if I'm being controversial here, but I think I feel as though PowerPoint has kind of encouraged this a little bit by people can just have all the lessons pre-planned, so they don't have to think maybe as much as they should about the the lessons. That's why I spend most of my time just thinking about maths and thinking about tasks, where they can go in the classroom, what you can use it for, and it's like I feel as though that part of maths teaching is missing a little bit maybe from from what I see. I don't know if that's too controversial, but that's probably how I feel. I don't think it's that controversial. I think there's obviously a, a place for both. And I think some of those like classic tasks that you're referring to, A, I think some people probably aren't aware of them now because they probably haven't been exposed to them. And B, I think some people need to know that, that it's okay to sometimes use those and put up a, if, if the answer is 20, then what is the question? And have something that open but I think that people need permission for that because I think there's been a lot of focus on, and rightly so, curriculum being high quality and fairly rigid and well well sequenced and well designed. But there there should be freedom for a little bit of fun and open mm. every now and then. I think uh, when I you know when sit, sitting down and designing a task, obviously you need to think about like Johnny said, what are you teaching? What is the learning objective? What what is your intention for them to come away from your room now having a better understanding of or knowing or seeing in a different way? If you want to pull out misconceptions that they may have about something, then maybe you're doing a multiple choice question or you're doing a matching activity. Or if you want to see how they can apply their understanding about something, then you're doing something more open. If you want to see how they've understood a definition of a scientific term or a term of geography then you might just ask them to regurgitate it in their own words you know or like filling the gaps to see if they've really taken in what you've said and then later on making it more open and I think sometimes there's a that kind of old school you know starter main 
now you're going to do your independent work and that independent work has to be a long task that's just one task rather than being able to work through lots of little tasks like i watched um neil design a a history booklet i can't remember what it was on now was it history or geography he's in the next room he could tell me for for a staff meeting he was doing on their curriculum and it was just a, all the different, the tiny little tasks that they would do in a lesson. And, the, you know, the reason why you would choose those things. And it is because you want to put out a misconception or do you just want them to take the terms in? Do you want them to be able to, mm-hmm. thank you, it's geography. Do you want them to be able to then explain their understanding? And I think, again, being given that freedom and seeing that that's a really good thing where you can do little tasks and then a little bit more input and little tasks and a little bit more input. And I think that's, Probably when I'm sitting down and designing lessons, I, I, I probably don't sit down and design tasks in isolation. I think I probably used to. Um, but now it's just that little and often. And what, what do I want them to get out of this section? What do I want them to get out of this section? And always thinking about what you want them to come away from your lesson knowing or seeing or understanding. I'm not going to use the word having, you know, I'm not going to say they've learned something because we can't see that. We can see them performing something, but we have to think about what I want to see from their performance and then how it links to what's come before, how it links to what comes next and what elements of challenge you can throw in there. I'm just reading the chat. Oh, Neil said, teach, do, practice, behave in humanities. That was it, which was particularly interesting. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure how familiar people are with the teach, do, practice, behave model. Last time I did it, I did a five hour day CPD on it. So I probably can't do it justice in a couple of minutes. But like most of my lessons when I was uh, sort of younger, younger in my career was just the teach and the do bit. Mm-hmm. Here's, here's how you do Pythagoras. And now you do some yourself. Great. You can find the high part in you, which you can find a short side as well. Brilliant. Next lesson, we'll move on to trig or something like that. But that I was missing all the practice and, and missing all the behaving mathematically, which is like my sort of little passion, I guess, with, with maths, where you actually, you know, stop and, and you make you make links with all the other areas of maths because school level maths, GCSE level maths, there's there's not that much to it at all. Everything, everything is related and everything is connected. And if and the more connections you make, the more you realise that there's there's not, there's not actually that much to it. And, in a way, every, everything is everything goes back to triangle numbers. I've decided. Um, whenever I'm whenever I'm doing a task, it always turns out that there's triangle numbers involved at some point. But it is making these connections and these these little wow moments you get for kids. Oh, I never realised that. Oh, yeah, mm. it's all just connected. One big massive web. If you want to get a sense of teach, do, practice, behave, uh, check out Dave's podcast or well, our podcast. Um, on th- well, Thursday mornings, they're about what 15, 20 minutes long, depending if Stuart's involved or not. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah, we're about an hour of Stuart, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we just pick a particular topic, don't we, of maths, and we, and we, we talk through the teach, do, practice, uh, behave, behave cycle with it, and it's, it's great fun. Really gets you thinking deep about a topic. Well, thinking yeah. deep as well, there, Kieran. Using exactly. The well, that's copyright. I, I do tell <laughs> Dave, I, I will litigate if he uses it during the podcast yeah. episodes. <laughs> Andy has slides. Which so you've got example tasks from each of those phases. Um, I think one of the most recent ones I recorded. I don't know if it's been released yet. Is about um, money and making different amounts using or the fewest number of coins kind of thing. Ooh, um, yeah. So in the last session, he was saying about how he doesn't like teaching that to year one and year two. So he could go there, he can look at it, and he can sort of um, take it, um, take inspiration from it. Um, mm. I mean, I've got my opinion on the things that I like to do. But Elliot, I'm going to throw it to you before um, before I sort of weigh in. What what, do, what are you thinking about when you're designing a task? And maybe with a, a broader than mathematics um, sort of lens. Yeah. So I, I always think about broadly two things. So the first thing is the design process itself that I'm going to use. And then the second part is the, the design of the task itself. So the first one, the design, the design process, in my mind, there's two ways of going about it. The first one is like a big macro, uh, like zoomed out, looking at the entire unit or entire curriculum, which is like what, what I call the hierarchical model. So you're looking at like that end goal, that superordinate goal, like what is it I want people to learn at the end of this unit? So like, um, I want them to be able to write an essay about uh, the Bolshevik revolution or whatever it may be. 
And then it's thinking about, right, what's all the different pieces of requisite knowledge or tasks that I need them to do in order for them to be able to go and achieve that final essay at the end of the unit. Mm -hmm. And that's a good way of breaking down all the requisite knowledge and relevant knowledge, especially when we as teachers take that sort of knowledge for granted and, and think like, oh, they should pick it up easily. It helps you to break it down into sort of those tiny steps uh, and helps you to visualize it as a, as a unit or series of lessons to uh, help minimize any uh, cognitive overload. The second type of process is more like micro looking at an individual lesson, but I suppose you could also use it uh, zoomed out as well. It's called backwards design. So it's just three steps. You're thinking about like the, what's the desired result? So what is it I want every pupil to be able to do or know or say at the end of this lesson? Once you've established that, then you think about, right, going backwards, what's the evidence that I would need to see or hear that demonstrates to me they have learned or can do that thing. Um, and then once the last step is right now, I go and plan my instruction and task because I know those things that I want them to do, how I want to see that they've done it. And that, that's my task. Um, so that, those are like the design processes. But then I think about the design of the task itself. And then it's the same things that like Johnny and Shannon have been saying. So what is it I want the learner to think about do? How do I guide their attention? Um, what sort of level of challenge am I going to do? Like the low floor, high ceiling that Johnny said, what scaffolds will I provide? What am I going to say to a child if they get stuck? What am I going to say to a child if they're breezing through it and I need to challenge them further? Um, th those are the sort of things I think about broadly. Um, yeah, like I said, there's no there's no set of features, is there? We said it earlier on for individual tasks that are like generically applicable across tasks. But I think those sort of design processes can be broadly applied regardless of subject. Yeah, I think um, like what you were saying about that end goal of what you want them to be able to get to and the kind of, you know, the breadcrumbs that you need to lead to it and Emma's said in the chat as well it's scary how many teachers don't plan from the end goal and I think about when I started teaching it was probably one of the, the better examples of um what what we did in my NQT year of like when we were teaching an English lesson or an English sequence either even and we would always go from the end goal of what do I want them to have to write at the end and then you would have to think about the steps they would take and then you would have to teach them but I think for some reason that doesn't happen for history or science or geography art whatever it is you know you need to think about what, what do you want them to do at the end of this and I know people like Lloyd um in their humanities curriculum they have quite a lot of like essays as the end of, end of kind of unit pieces so if you want them to be able to like you said Morgs answer that essay question what do they need to know what do they need to, be, to do what do they need to be exposed to and you could do the same with like a nice meaty maths problem if they're going to tackle this and what do they need to do and I know that um mm. s planning has been fashionable in some maths hubs and I you know whether you like it or not people start with an end goal and then they work backwards and say well what are the tiny nuggets that need to be put in place for this child to be successful in this objective or task whatever it might be but I don't think we have a lot of time to do that I think Matt said, was it six minutes for every hour of instruction that we have to plan if you're a one form in a one form entry school? Um, it's not a lot. So yeah. we don't have the time to put all of that thinking. And actually, when I was in my second school, we did like a form of lesson study and um, which I was going to talk about later, but I'll talk about it now. And um, and uh, we were feeding back to each other about how how it was going. And I said, oh, do you know, it was really great because the the head took all the kids in the hall for like an hour in the afternoon for an extra long assembly while all of the teachers got to like plan collaboratively and plan a sequence of lessons that we would go and then teach and watch and whatever um and I said oh it was just great because we had a really big chunk of time dedicated to thinking about every minute detail and every minute of every lesson and what was going to be and he said well shouldn't you be doing that anyway <laughs> I don't have the time. I would love to. But, mm. And then this is why we get people going to famous resource websites, because yeah. we don't have the time. So you can't blame them. Yeah. But maybe we need to think more about our tasks. I have the luxury in my teaching job, like Monday to Wednesday, I'm, I'm in the classroom. And I have part of my role is like lead practitioner going around, going around classes, ob observing teachers and literally just telling them, um, or given given them feedback on, on on what I've seen, but it's all very very 
that was part of my role. It's like math specific, and so I, even to the point of okay, I would have used this task here. And like, while I'm sat watching them, I'll just like scribble down a little completion table on my notes or something. Mm -hmm. If I'm feeling really kind, I'll even type it up for them in PowerPoint or whatever. And if I'm super kind and I really like the task, I'll make a version on Massport or something for them as well. So, here you go. Here's a random version you can use. Um, and, and that's the sort of thing um, which I think is really, really useful. Literally concrete, specific thing that you can use. At an actual task that you might want to use um, next lesson. Quite often, like, my department will take the mix saying, oh, I could have done with that last week or something before I taught the before I taught the topic. So, well, you've got it for next year, haven't you? Or you might have another class which is a couple of weeks behind or something like that. But yeah, I do love that. That's one of my favourite parts of the of the of the job, going into a classroom and just saying, okay, here's something you might want to try with them next lesson or something. It's just like the thing Shannon said, it just made me think that I think like the national curriculum in itself is like a little bit partially to blame here. Because like sometimes in like a geography or something, it will just say one bullet point. Uh, and it might be like compare human and physical features or whatever. And it's like, well, the, it's up to whoever's the designing the curriculum to actually think about what's the breaking that down into the requisite steps. Um, and sometimes if you're a teacher who hasn't been involved in the curriculum, design, you just get handed. So you just go and teach it how, how it's been handed to you. But that's the sort of thought that needs to go in it. And I think that demonstrates the need for this being like within a department or within a year group, like Johnny just said, where you go around and see each other and, and discuss that at length. Stuart in the last session on curriculum talked about storytelling and I think even right from your IWU to your independent task you're, you're you're trying to tell a story from the start to the end um, and I always go back to the the paper by Ann Watson John Mason 2006 I think it was the second one so it has the has B whenever you look online you know it'll be 2006B and it talks about seeing the task as a mathematical object and almost, you know, how did it was the first time I'd think, OK, instead of having 30 random questions, how did these six questions behave with each other? And what's the story they're telling, which is a a part of the bigger story? It's almost like mathematical tasks as box sets. You know, I'm sure no one's thought of that before. So maybe I can write a blog or something about that. And um, because, yeah, I think that's inspired. But, yeah, this this little story within this bigger story, which is then within the story that you're trying to tell across the across the sequence of lessons um, but yeah but I mean you guys have absolutely hit the nail on the head one thing we're not mentioned which is related to that theme like you were talking about a story of six questions that you might use uh, with the sort of um, popularity of visualizers now in the classroom I find them so useful for telling a story and as as with all classes like some kids might have missed part of the story or whatever because they've not been here for a few lessons or you might need to change the story halfway through because kids aren't getting it and that's another advantage um, i think for having a visualizer rather than a pre-prepared powerpoint for example where okay you do the first two bits of your story your first two questions oh the kids are finding this too easy well my third question i'm gonna move on i'm gonna advance the story quite a lot because i don't need to i don't need to go through all these questions or Hang on, my kids are struggling with this part of the story. Let's do a few more of the easy bits, the easy bits first. And it's that responsive teaching. Um, so I suppose responsive task design, I guess, if we're going to try and keep it on, on theme, I think it's really important. And that's what, um, I mean, the visualizer has been a game changer for me uh, since well, about six or seven years probably now. I've had one in my classroom. It's been, it's been amazing. Yeah, I had one for a few years. I don't have one anymore because I changed to a different school and I'll trust in September. So if any visualizer companies are listening and want to send me one, feel free because they are expensive. I'd, I'd say that is an essential bit of equipment now for any school. Mm. So you have live modeling. I don't think you can beat it, can you? Live yeah. modeling where they can see everything on the screen because the teacher isn't in the way. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and you can, you can also see all the class while you're doing it as well. Yeah. And it's like, yeah yeah i mean i do like writing on a whiteboard but that's more as a sort of like collaborative sort of task thing we're doing a task together the whiteboard is for our ideas but if i want something like in their books exactly how i how i'm doing it more on the sort of i do we do sort of style thing okay book slice down the middle here's my example here's your turn do it exactly the same sort of thing yeah. that's where the visualizer comes into its own quite often we take for granted the ability to think about when more or fewer questions are needed. I mean, in my last role, I would spend a lot of time with our newest teachers looking at the structure of questions and say, okay, what is it about this question that's really difficult? 
mm. let's write five more like that. So that they would have a post-it note ready to go if, as they imagined or we imagined, the, the class got stuck at a certain point. You know, what is it about this one? What's different from this one to the to the others? Because obviously you're, you're looking at increasingly difficult and more complex questions yeah. and, and you'll have some sort of general truth revealed in one of the questions. I mean, that comes back to a, a classic sort of boilerplate, boilerplate task that you can have. Give me an example of an easy one or a hard one. So like you could do like one, two, three, four, 1,234 plus, I don't know, 2,345. Why is that a really easy question compared to, I don't know, say 89 plus 78? Mm. You've got more digits in the first one. It looks, it looks scary. You could even put decimal points in the first one, but you've got no carrying. You've got no exchanging to do. It's an easy question. Um, and getting kids to notice that and pick out those features of what makes a question hard and what makes a difficult question. Standard form is a classic one at secondary maths um, where you have to mess around with the end of it, making sure that the first digits between between sort of one and ten. Um, that that um, that is that's just a classic sort of boilerplate, boilerplate task that you can use all the time. I've not mentioned ATMs thinkers, and I can't not end the hour without sending that. They've got like a list of about I think it's. 16 or something of just these boilerplate questions that you can just ask give me an example of a hard one which one doesn't belong sort of thing always sometimes never those sort of classic things um, it's a brilliant book how do you know if a task has worked how you'd hoped and what do you do if it has not because obviously that's going to be quite a common occurrence the less experience we have um, so what do we do in that situation? It's difficult to know if it's worked. It goes back to that proxy. Like Kids might give you a fully correct task as they're leaving the classroom. Completion table, say, fully correct completion table. They've done everything you asked of you, but you've got no guarantee there, have you? The, the proof of the pudding will be next lesson or in a week's time or in a month's time, whether they can still do it. Um, it's hard to answer that one. I mean, it's, it's easier to tell... If, if it's gone badly because you'll have incomplete tasks, you'll have kids asking loads of questions constantly, like what's going on sort of stuff. It's easy to know when things are going really wrong uh, compared to when things are going perfectly swimmingly. You feel good about the feeling good swimmingly lessons, but but then, okay, did you give them enough challenge? Did they already know what you were trying to teach them? There's so many things to consider. It's, it's quite hard, that question. Yeah, I think like, like Johnny's saying, like the proof is in the checks for understanding, whether that be in questioning, in assessments later down the line or within that task itself. Like ideally, you've got some sort of assessment opportunity built into, into the task that like you can reflect on as a, as a class. Like a lot of teachers utilize a plenary at the end of a lesson. That's, that's a perfect time, isn't it? To, I mean, some might use it to extend learning, which is fine. Um, but I think there's a strong case for using that as your chance to check that everyone really has understood today's content before mm -hmm. you go on to the next lesson, because that could affect what next lesson needs to be. And then you have to go back to drawing board and, pl and plan again. Um, yeah. And uh, ideally, the task can like, like I'm thinking back to um, Johnny's table task that he talked to the completing the table task. Like, ideally, you have a task that sort of has built into it like this instant feedback. So like in maths, it might be like, right, Remember, we're doing this today. Your answer has to be an odd number. So, like, if they're, they're doing a task independently while you're supporting others and they get an even number, well, there's their instant feedback that they've got it wrong and they need to go back and then check it, don't they? Um, and I'm sure, like, that table could be perfect for that because it's got, like, the conditions yeah. at the top. And if it hasn't met the conditions, then they know they've got it wrong. Have, having that sort of instant feedback built into the task is perfect because it not only allows the learner to see the mistake for themselves and think about it without seeking adult support, it also gives you loads more time to go and support others who are struggling with the task. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're basically talking about by calculating colouring there. Like if the, if the sheet looks rubbishly coloured in at the end, they, 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 you know they've got it all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but no, it's, it's a good point. It is like, and often I build into my task this, um, this quick, quick error checking thing like I know that down this side of the table you're just going to get the numbers one to ten in, in a random order but you don't tell the kids that so you can quickly quickly mark the, yeah. the work as well and things like solving equations kids are dreadful at like solving equations and not just actually going back and checking it makes sense they're like out of all the GCSE questions probably solving equations are the easiest ones for kids to actually go back and check and see if it makes sense because essentially they're turning a solving equation into a substitution question 
at the end, substitute x into this expression, do you get this answer? Yes, I do. Well, I've solved my equation right then. How often do we get kids to do that? I'm guilty of maybe not doing as much as I should. Yeah, the um, second part was, uh, what do we do if it hasn't worked? Yeah. Again, like tricky to answer, but I think a lot of that is about respond being responsive in the moment. So, right, what scaffold do I need to use now or what prompt do I need to like push them yeah. on or whatever it may be? And I think often, sometimes it is literally just being like, right, everyone pencils down, we're going back to the visualizer, everyone eyes on me, doing it again. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Accepting that, look, sometimes that's the case. Like, I mean, I'm sure everyone in this chat, we've been teaching years and years, we still give a task every now and again that doesn't go the way we want. And mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. It's all about how you take that information and what you do next. Mm -hmm. How are you going to implement that task again next time so that that issue doesn't happen? Um, and, and I think a lot of the best tasks are just through that iterative process, the designed and redesigned yeah. again and again over time. And I think if you're working out what to do next, if it's not gone how you'd hoped, you have to think about what level it's not gone well on. Is it your explanation wasn't good enough because none of the class have got it? which I think is rare. I think it's rare that the, an entire class um, doesn't get something or doesn't work their way through a task. Is it just, you know, a subgroup that you can pull together and intervene there and then? Do you need to do a little bit more instruction? Do you need to go back a step? Did you make an assumption about their prior knowledge? And then you think, oh, no, I've missed that. Um, so, it's yeah, it's just you working out on what scale has it not worked. I and hold then, the hands up here, yeah. I'm guilty of this, Shannon, all the time. Like, I'll maybe have a really good task lined up my sleeve, and like, and I'll give it to the kids, and and like, they weren't quite ready for it. They needed a bit more, a bit more instruction, a bit more practice at the basics before I give them the task. And then I, you're kicking yourself at the end of the lesson, thinking, mm -hmm. oh, why, why have I given them that now? They needed an extra half an hour or an extra, an extra full lesson potentially on it. Um, whereas. Um, yeah, but I think like realizing that in the first place is quite quite a good position to be in, and being being responsive and just being able to just change a lesson on the fly. It's it's the mark of a what a, what a decent teacher, any decent teacher should do, mm. rather than maybe when I was younger in my career. Okay, here's my lesson. It's all nicely prepared on a on a smart notebook or a PowerPoint, and I'm getting to that last slide, and I don't care I don't care what the kids are learning. I'm clicking through these 25 slides and I'm going to finish with my plenary here. And my plenary all, always used to be like a rock hard question. And like, <laughs> that's, not, that's not what a plenary is about. And a, a Craig Barton writes in one of his, one of his hundreds of books that he's got, like plenary um, shouldn't just be a really hard question based on what you've been doing. It should, what the kids all get wrong because they can't do. And then they just leave feeling demoralized. <laughs> For me, a plenary should be about, okay, here's a question, no no harder than what you've been doing, but here's the connections to the other area of maths that it, mm. that it links to. So we've just been doing a lesson on triangle numbers, maybe look at something to do with handshakes or, um, oh, I don't know, square numbers or something like that. There's always something nice you can, you can link it to, um, which gives that nice wow factor, builds those connections, and just gets kids interested in maths, I think. All of that stuff we've talked about, about being responsive, um, links to something that Emma said in the chat about. It's a challenge of really good, for really good questions for foundation subjects where teacher subject knowledge isn't very good. And then them being able to be responsive in a lesson, in a history lesson, a geography lesson, a science lesson, a computing lesson, whatever it might be. It, they're likely to be um, far less responsive because their subject knowledge just isn't where it needs to be for them to be able to, to act in the moment. And that's something that, you know, we all need to keep working on subject knowledge PD and, and our curriculum because otherwise they, those lessons aren't going to be taught as well. And I'm sure they're not taught as well in a lot of places. It's been fascinating talking to you guys about uh, task design. Maybe one to pick up another time as well and maybe go into a bit more depth. All I'll say through is say thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you.